Welcome to the Donahue Group. Delighted you could join us. We have a great half hour of conversation about state issues that will knock your socks off and or at least keep them on because it's awfully cold today and, um, and I guess we need all the warmth we can get. Um, I want to welcome my fellow panelists, Ken Risto, mouthy but humble social <laughs> studies teacher. Um, what does really, that mean? I just, don't know. Really just pretty mouthy, but there you go. Tom Paneski with a cheerful smile and a wonderful red sweater, uh, <sighs> professor of mathematics at University of Wisconsin Sheboygan campus. Like a Smother Brothers routine. You like Tom best. <laughs> I really do. Um, and uh, Cal Potter, former state senator, former assistant superintendent of public education and library division. Overall thoughtful guy who really is the passion on the show, believe it or not. Uh, you would think that somebody mouthier might be, but not so much. So I'm Mary Lynn. Well, we know where I am in the pecking order, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Before I lose track. Tremendous, fantastic, <laughs> mouthy. Mouthy. <laughs> mouthy. Okay. Before yeah, I lose right. track and forget my name, I'm Mary Lynn Donahue and uh, a humble lawyer with a, with a humble law firm, Hop Newman Humkey, recently relocated 21. 24 Kohler Memorial Drive. So, and they weren't evicted, were they? <laughs> no. Wait, no. we really were not. But it's it's interesting moving from downtown, which I loved, to not downtown, which uh, has its advantages, clear advantages. But um, I miss I miss being down. I miss the library. Just walking mm. to the library and you can't and sleep back. as late anymore. You have to drive further, don't you? There you go. It's a mile yeah. and a half instead of a half a mile. Yeah. So, but uh, in any event. We're here to talk about state issues, and there's a lot to talk about. Um, just in the news today, M&I Bank, the largest bank in Wisconsin, posted a huge quarterly loss um, at the end of 2008. Um, they are going to be laying off a, a large number of people. Their stock price is tanked, so I think it is kind of a sign of the times. I think it's still a very sound bank. I mean, I don't think there's any question about its, its uh, financial stability, but even the even the good guys are going down these days, and um, J.P. Morgan is well. In any event, it's it's not the the cheeriest scene. Um, in the context of um, as my mom used to call it, hell in a handbasket, um, we're looking at a 5.4 billion dollar deficit at the state level. Now I understand that's 5.4 represents what people would like, and is not the actual working deficit. And I don't know if I understand that, Cal, you're our state guy. Mm. It's um, two years, right? That's yeah, the two years. And that's the two year budget. Okay. Too. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Governor Doyle has gone with other governors to ask President elect Obama for $1 trillion, uh, you know, sin boldly. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get out of this? Well, it's not the first time the state has had uh, budgetary problems. Um, a lot of those, not only is it the wish list of agencies, but you, to, what you do is uh, most of the budget, 75% of it, is formulas. It's shared revenue formula, it's a school aid formula, it's transportation aids. And so when you take a look at what the needs will be of districts, school districts, of municipalities, and then you look at what you should do if you try to maintain that same commitment in those formulas. And that does not mean, however, that you have to keep the formula. Um, right. Like, for example, two-thirds state pickup of schools, that's a nice uh, commitment, but if you shoot for 64% rather than 66%, you know, you can save some money there. Shared revenues, you know, historically have been a certain percentage if you cut 2% there. So a number of these areas can be cut back. So when we talk about $5 billion, it's if you meet your, fully meet your formula commitments in most cases. And one of the things that, uh, look at the red uh, vest that, that we have next to it, Lee Dreyfus used to lament all the time how the state budget is really d driven by formulas, and it is. And that's why I hear people often say, the state ought to slash spending. Well, it's really, uh, if you slash the formulas, you actually, because 75% is formulas, you're going to hurt municipalities and counties and so on and school districts. That's basically how the state operates. And uh, so I think it's a doable situation, freezing state spending, freezing hiring, maybe hedge a little bit on some of the formulas. It can be done, but it's not going to be easy because, of course, that uh, education today isn't any cheaper and running a county isn't any cheaper and municipality isn't any cheaper. So they, too, have to then cut. And so it, there is a ripple effect, which can include layoffs on all levels of government. And so it's not going to be an easy task. It's not going to be a pleasant task. 
So Democrats who have now controlled both <coughs> the legislature and the governor's office are coming in at a time where they can set the priorities, right. but the, the, the whole mess is in their lap. Exactly. It's not an enviable position. And uh, it's the same at the national level. Yeah. Uh, I mean, hell in a handbasket and here's your handbasket right. and, and, you know, what are you going to do? We have all these levels of government and sometimes we lament the fact that we have too many levels of government and I think the governor, uh, McAllen, when he was acting governor, wanted to do something about that and, of course, that was the kiss of death for him when he ran for re-election or when he ran for election. But there's an opportunity now when you don't have any money uh, Counties, towns, villages, you're going to have to cooperate. You've got to do something. You know, you're not going to get what you got in the past. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. I don't know if that will come out that way. But, uh, and the other but, thing is that people have to realize that you know, states are just a victim of this. It's, 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 you know, when, the good, when the times are good, the, the money's rolling. But when the times are bad and you rely on a sales tax and an income tax and a declining yeah. economy, and technically, strictly speaking, the, unlike the national government, the state can't really borrow money. You know, they have ways of putting things offline and yeah. playing around a little bit with that, but creating different accounts. But for the most part, they really have to make some tough, some tough, tough decisions. Yeah. The last recession, the big one we had, was when uh, uh, Tony Earle was in office, and Tony really did something that I don't think is maybe very easily done today: raise taxes. We went from a four to a five percent sales tax. I voted for that, and I heard about it for a couple of elections <laughs> after that. Sure. But it was a, to a point where the 4% sales tax was not meeting your commitment for shared revenue and for school aids and so on. And it was either you took a meat axe to those aid programs, and we weren't <clears throat> picking up two-thirds at that time. We were probably right. in the 40s percent state pickup for school aids. Mm -hmm. And the only alternative was to, uh, was to raise the sales tax. And, the, and those kinds permanent. of things, uh, yeah. yeah, and those kinds of things aren't going to no, aren't going to no. happen much mm -hmm. anymore. And um, because this is a much more severe situation than we had at that time. That that's yeah. that's true. So um, I do think the Democrats are going to have a hard time of it. And if I were in the Republican minority, I'd I'd try to make everything I could out of the fact that it's the Democrats that well, are they're in vote charge. For it, whatever they put forth, that it's an opportunity yeah. for the Republicans to sure. be a little vocal, make some hay, make sure. some points, uh, look wise, because they don't mm. have the votes. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and it's time that they could look wise. Yeah, so okay. it's, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's 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 interesting. Um, with that in mind, um, I was intrigued by an article in the uh, Journal Sentinel uh, that uh, County Executive Scott Walker uh, has refused to provide any gu uh, guidance to the governor in terms of projects that the uh, Milwaukee County uh, could use money for that would be part of the Obama stimulus package. One of the things that I like, and maybe this is naive on my part, but um, if you're looking at a depression type economic stimulus and you're looking at improving the infrastructure. So, I mean, in the 30s, Roosevelt created the civilian conservation camps and Works progress, progress and that kind of thing. I mean, this, the Obama piece of this seems to be a variation on that. Well, I think, I think Milwaukee County, of all counties, should be willing to participate in that. And Holloway, who I think is the president of the county board, has done his own list. but. I just don't think that's smart for Walker. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I'm absolutely stunned, given the needs of Sheboygan, uh, Sheboygan County, Milwaukee County. Pardon me, Milwaukee County, in terms of transportation needs and infrastructure needs. To, it's certainly not free money, but here's an opportunity to stimulate, uh, create, the, economy. stimulate the economy, create jobs, give people employment, and set the foundation for uh, prosperity. And we talked about Roosevelt. I mean. And then later on, Eisenhower's in investment in, in, uh, in the interstate system, uh, you know, massive public works programs. And these are roads and bridges and highs we're using today. The county courthouse in Sheboygan was, was the PWA, the, the successor, the post office. It's murals inside. Uh, parts of Urban oh. Middle School, the Evergreen Park, and the list goes on and on. And, and the, I think even the armory itself had some yeah. renovations done during that time. Uh, these are things that, you know, you're just not you know, raking leaves and digging holes only to have some other group behind you bury them. These are, this is infrastructure that you're going to have for 40 or 50 years. It's not like in America where we build a new sports facility every 10 years when the Bucks want a new, a new place to play. I mean, the public schools we have are, you know, 70, 80, 90 years old. These are, this is an opportunity. 
as bad as the situation is, this is an opportunity for us to really do some good things um, that lays the foundations for prosperity later. I, I just have no idea beyond scoring points with the right wing talk radio show hosts down in you know WISN and so on why Walker's doing this. Yeah. Um, just I was stunned when I when I read that article. Yeah. Well, and we'll see. I mean, we keep talking about, I mean, literally just manufacturing money. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, of course, and this is, I mean, Reagan did this in the, you know, the, the 1980 recession. Um, uh, you dramatically increase spending levels. I think we've learned that, and it tends to work. Mm -hmm. um, and it has some built-in inflationary tendencies, but by and large, it tends to work. And I think improving, and I hadn't realized, yes, I mean, all these pieces of our community that are just... I mean, there's an article today in the paper about the 75th uh, birthday of the post office and, um, and the murals, as you indicated. Yeah. I mean, these are long-lasting public infrastructure pieces that mean a lot to us. And I love going into the post office. I love going into the courthouse, which is a, f a fabulously gorgeous building, um, at you know, at least the original parts of it. And uh, so, yeah, it, it is, as we say, a puzzlement, and, um, and we'll see how that resolves. Lots of other things going on in the state. We talked in our local show about the mayoral race. We didn't really touch now that I think of it on some aldermanic races, but um, at, the, um, at the state level, the Supreme Court race is just two. Um, two candidates, uh, Chief Justice Shirley Abrahamson is running for re-election, her third term, third full term. And- uh, These are 10-year terms? Their ten-year terms, and then Jefferson County uh, Judge uh, Kosovich, I believe, is the name. Um, not well known, um, but neither was you will be. Uh, neither was uh, Judge Gableman uh, when he beat uh, Justice Butler. And interestingly enough, as I understand it, the fellow who ran Gableman's campaign is also going to be running um, uh, uh, the Jefferson County Judge's campaign. So, you know, you question whether we're going to have more of the hideous same thing that we went are. on. Sure. You bet we are. Sure. Yeah. It has worked. Yeah, exactly. That's right. <clears throat> it's worked. Well, the balance of the court has already changed, so I think, you know, will, will WMC be willing to put in the kind of money that it did? Shirley Abrahamson is going to be a whole lot harder, in my opinion, to knock yes. off than Lewis Butler was. I mean, she is one tough cookie. That's right. Um, and Chief Justice. So she's got the platform that she's, you know, can out her, her expertise from. I mean, I think when Sharon Rose took her on 10 years ago, I think the, the chief had, I think, 70 out of 72 sheriffs in the state endorse her. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she has credentials and endorsements from all over the place. Um, she is 76. I would hope, I would hope <laughs> at 66 to have, you know, a tenth of the energy yes. that she does. Yeah. I mean, she's just... Um, She's just, uh, you know, the Energizer bunny. She just mm -hmm. keeps going. And, of course, we know nothing about the, the opponent, but we didn't know anything about Gableman either. And um, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I, I think that the chief, though, will run a very dignified campaign. I mean, she certainly is going to respond to some of the idiocies that will be thrown at her. There's going to be no question about that. Uh, eloquently. Eloquently and with, dig with dignity. Now, of course, the the independent groups, you know, you can't control what they're going to say and what they're going to do, and and uh, we'll see how that works. But you know, I I just got the impression in speaking with her a couple of months back that you know she's fully anticipating having a really horrible campaign, and she's fully anticipating. You know, she looked at me and said, "I'm not going to get down in the gutter with folks, but but also if things are said that are just out and out as we found on the last campaign, just inaccurate." Um, she's, yeah, you're right, she's a tough, she's a very yeah, dignified yeah, person, but yeah. she's tough. But, yeah. but in 20 years, uh, yeah. all her decisions oh, uh, sure. can come under question. Oh, yeah. Some of them, are some of the decisions. Sure. So that could be an issue. Sure. See, the, 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 the question, though, is, is oftentimes when you're making a judicial ruling, you're standing up for the rule of law, or you're standing up for due process, you're standing up for this little thing called the Bill of Rights. And when you do that, it gets translated into a commercial that you're, you're opening up the jails and letting the prisoners run amok among, among us in society. And that's where I always, you know, my blood pressure starts rolling when I watch the television because there are times, you know, where you have to stand for the rule of law. And in the process, we know full well that means that you may have to give, you know, someone who's been convicted another trial. 
Um, and that's kind of lost in the public too. There is this perception that when judges reverse decisions and things, people go running free as opposed to normally they're you know, mistrials and then trials are done again. And, and that's, that's my mm -hmm. issue with, I think, that looking at her. Record. And I think judges are very, very cognizant of that for these days. And of course, part of this comes back to, and, uh, and this just segues very nicely into a piece that appeared um, uh, in the uh, Journal Sentinel a couple of days ago. Um, the uh, Judicial Commission, which is charged by the state to um, regulate judges' behavior, and I mean, that's where ethics complaints are filed and so forth, um, did file a complaint against uh, Justice Gableman for the um, what they call an outright lie, a knowing lie in that um, uh, ad against uh, Justice Butler about him springing a, you know, a, a sex fiend who then went out and molested a child. And I mean, it was just not true. Um, and um, he had requested um, that the um, uh, commission, um, uh, the judicial commission, be barred from presenting its case to a special three panel, three judge panel that's looking at this. And the, the, the panel said, no, you know, we're going to go and continue ahead. But um, I just thought that was very interesting. But then you get, and that's just the tough thing here, is that then you have the Supreme Court needing, as it did with Justice Ziegler, um, they need to rule on their colleagues' behavior. And these are people that they work with. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very tough situation, I think. And I think what the chief is going to be pushing hard for, I think, um, but I think most of us can agree is that there should be state funding for Supreme Court races. And, um, and that there needs to be a way that that happens so that free speech rights are not, are not denied, um, but that we just, we stop this. I mean, hey, we're back to campaign financing right, again. Right. I know it. We really <laughs> it doesn't are. take much to get yeah. there. <laughs> but at, at the for the judiciary, um, it, there are certainly lively arguments I think that can be made on both sides in terms of campaign finance reform in, in, in the legislature. But in the judiciary, when what do we do when all of the justices have received contributions from people who are before them and we don't have a majority of the Supreme Court that can even rule on a case? So you have three justices making a decision because four of them have had to recuse themselves because they've gotten money from this or this or this or this. That hasn't happened, has it? It's come close. Several of the cases. It has come close. And... And now the light, as a result of the Ziegler complaint, the light is shining very brightly on, on these campaign contributions. And the judges, judges never ask for money. They never personally ask for money. Uh, they can't. And, uh, you know, so you'll never have Justice Abraham say, uh, Abramson saying, give me money. But you have all sorts of people who say that on her behalf and, sure. and, and, and all, all the over the place. And, else, they they right. like a person's... Judicial right. philosophy, so they want to support that sure. person's judicial philosophy. Right, and then the judiciary should just—it should be really nonpartisan, and and this kind of stuff just shouldn't go on. I mean, I don't think we're serving—we're not serving our communities well at all by doing this. Well, see, that's the Cal, Cal Potter uh, soapbox. Said very well. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking I of, I vote aye for public. I think, well, I think on the way over here, I was driving on the, on the way over to the taping here. They they did make an announcement that the state electoral commission is going to require that at least these independent groups now publicly mm -hmm. publish publicly publish. They would have to, right? Disclose. Uh, they disclose where disclose the where their coming money's from. coming yes. from for these ads. Uh, where in the and past I'm sure they that could, will be litigated, and who knows what. Yeah. The decision will be after this. Do you know. think that that rule will be in place in time for the uh, judicial? Uh, well, I judicial think it race? is in place. It's just a matter of I don't know whether it's going to be challenged in some way. This is the ruling by the Government Accountability yes. Board, yeah. which is yeah. consists of retired judges. Yeah, it's in judges. place. Okay, yeah. Government Accountability but, Board. Thank you. Know, you. I, I, somebody can charge. Can imagine go to court and say this is sure. abridgment of freedom of expression. I mean, that's what the basis of previous uh, court mm -hmm. cases has been. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You're not saying they can't contribute. You just have. You're saying. You just got to make. That's it. why I, I marvel at people who, who say that this is really bad public policy. So this is disclosure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're jumping around a little bit, but um, the state superintendent of education race is. We had a couple candidates who had to just kind of claw their way in, 
get their nomination papers back and not doctor them up, but mm -hmm. get them in better working order. And so I think there are six candidates I believe so. running. Now that's not a high profile race. No, it, no it isn't, um, particularly this time because uh, we don't have an incumbent. Um, State Superintendent Burmaster, after two terms, has decided to, to retire and allow, I think, uh, a very qualified candidate, in my opinion, uh, Tony Ebers, who's a former student of mine at Plymouth High School. Is that right? Yes. He Full was disclosure. He's also a former <laughs> oh, boss of mine because he was picked as the deputy and I was an assistant superintendent, so I would see him every day in his office anyhow. Um, and he, uh, his, well, he's a, he's a native son of Sheboygan County. His dad, sure. Doc Ebers, was the uh, uh, physician at Rocky Knoll when it was a sanitarium. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, okay. And his mother's in a nursing home in, this, in the county, so he does get back here uh, periodically. So he is, I think he's the front runner being the deputy now. And having run previously, he ran against John Benson, mm -hmm. and he ran as, against uh, Libby Burmaster. And uh, she was impressed with him enough that after the, she won, uh, she selected him as one of her former opponents to be in the deputy's position. So that sounds kind of like an endorsement. Yeah, I, I think he's a, a very qualified person. He's served as a teacher, a principal, a superintendent yep. in several districts. Yep. Um, common sense guy, nice fellow, um, bright, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> successful in spite of my teaching him, I guess. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but it, there, there are several others that uh, have educational credentials. I think one of the candidates is a Marquette professor uh, there's another who's a superintendent of schools. There's a teacher running, but as far as endorsements, uh, Tony Evers has already gotten the the uh, superintendents and the principals uh, endorsement. I suspect he'll get WEAC. Um, so I think the when you deal with these spring elections where the voter turnout is low, once you get the the principals and you get the superintendents and you get the school boards and you get the teachers, you've got a block of votes that's really in your corner that's very helpful. Right. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and it, it doesn't take much sometimes no. to, to tip that balance. So well, thank you for that he's, information. I think he's the candidate to beat in, mm -hmm. in, the, right. in the race. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've met mm -hmm. Tony a couple times at a variety of different meetings or formats or conferences. and, and Yeah, very eminently sensible, real, real sharp guy. So, so so that primary will take place in February then? Is yes. that it? Yes. Okay, right. So the 6th then go down, okay. Yeah. So probably not as, uh, not as publicized <clears throat> as the uh, Supreme Court race, no. but uh, an important position nonetheless. Yes, uh, Scott Jensen oh. is uh, back in the news. Uh, you may remember that his felony convictions uh, for misconduct in office were overturned by the Court of Appeals. And as you said, this doesn't mean that he gets to go scot-free and out romping around and and uh, caucusing again, but uh, he his pitch to the Court of Appeals was that his tri retrial should be in Waukesha County instead of Dane County, and the Court of Appeals has uh, recently ruled that uh, no, um, the the new trial will be in Dane County. He can certainly appeal, <coughs> excuse me appeal that to the Supreme Court. Hard to know what will happen there, but um, but he continues to duke it out. So um, yeah, and I think the the trial court in that case probably did not make a very good decision in the initial matter, so, you know, the conviction was overturned. Um, I think we're getting fairly close to the end of our, uh, uh, of our show, but um, we uh, just wanted to touch on a couple of other small things. Um, most of us here know Jamie Owlick. Jamie ran against uh, Joe Leibham for state senate um, mm -hmm. approaching four years ago, not quite three. I'm not sure when Joe's term is up. Well, we just had an election for assembly, so that's uh, midterm. Yeah. So it's two years ago. So it's just two, two years. years ago. Ago. <clears throat> it feels yeah, longer ago. Two. I was going to okay. say two. Yeah. In any event, um, Jamie is an incredibly nice young man, an Iraqi war veteran, uh, and I met him when he was running against Leibham, and um, a little naive at that time, not quite understanding what it meant to run against um, an icon, as it were. And uh, uh, but he, uh, Kevin Crawford, who is a very popular and energetic mayor of, of Manitowoc for 20 years, good guy, just a great guy has decided to retire, so Jamie is in the race, and I guess there is a, is a primary, and I know our listeners probably don't care a great deal about the Manitowoc mayor's race, but uh, um, I wish... Uh, I feel in your name, I guess. Mm -hmm. People would know Jamie. I think he's a very personable young man. Yeah, yes. and skilled. Yes. He's a bright yeah. guy. Yeah. I think he has well, a he master's degree. Well, he was elected county clerk, I believe, he was in Manitowoc County. So that's right. He served that for several years. Yeah, so, so kind of a good guy. Um, 
And um, uh, uh, I just wanted briefly for you to talk about the lawmakers being forced to accept their mm. raise of, I think it was 2.5 percent. Yeah, right? the $49,000 a year. It's considered two-thirds of full-time. It's billed, the salary is based on two-thirds of a middle management position in state government. And the system of not voting on these raises is something that was put in place by many of us uh, in the 1980s when we would never be able to get enough votes to have a pay raise. And you'd go several terms without any type of raise. And all of a sudden people are saying, this is crazy, you know, we're making such and such, everybody else is making this, is here's what the, the um, Department of Labor or something says we should be getting, here's what the other state workers are getting, um, the non-union people, we ought to have some type of uh, increase. Well, nobody would vote for it because they're all posing for holy pictures, you know, to their constituency. So they finally said, all right, let's put it into an independent panel, base it on middle management, two-thirds of middle management, whatever they get as non-union employees is what legislators would get. And it worked well for years. Well, it's now gone into uh, yeah. maybe a displeasure with some people. But I think it still is the, the best way to go. I sure. agree. It's always hard <clears throat> when you're an elected official sure. to raise your salary, and sure. it's kind of tough. We're coming to the end. And we're coming to the end in more than one ways because this is our last Donahue Group taping uh, of state issues. And we just all wanted to say goodbye to all of you, our, our listeners. Ken Risto said it was like seven or eight people, and I think it was more. Um, <laughs> but we've had a... <laughs> We've had a fine run of it. Um, we've been One here. Ago, she gets <laughs> like we thousand people. I think yes. she meant that. Yes, okay. I yeah. do have a personal fan club. A, a, a very nice lady. It's just one person, and she said she likes the clothes I wear. So I thought that was pretty nice, and you know, I kept that letter. I'm telling you. Um, but we want to thank all the folks that we've worked with out here. Channel Eight is really a fun place, um, and uh, Scott and Carrie have been great. Steve and Fritz are, are uh, loyal camera people, and Fritz are, as I said before, our built-in laugh track, and so we've, we've always enjoyed that. Um, watch public radio. I'm actually at the point where I have to agree with what Milton Storm wrote in a letter to the editor, which means that, and that's, those are very diverse opinions, but calling attention to the fact that Charter has moved Channel 8 to channel something or other, um, Public television is an incredibly important piece of American, current American fabric, and, and we need people to support it because anybody here in Sheboygan can have a TV show. We've had a great time of it. If you're thinking that you want to do it, you come out and try it. It's great fun, but we need to support our public television stations. So with that, we bid everyone adieu, and, um, and who knows, maybe when Hillary Clinton is president of the United States, we'll come back and, and start the show up again. Thanks so much for listening.